for having me out for this, and it's a, it's a great uh, honor to be uh, on Jared's list of senior friends that you can ask to do this. So what I, this is the Alpha and Omega. So you guys are the Alpha. You're at the beginning of your career. I'm the Omega. Because <laughs> I can see the end line from where I'm standing. So here's what I've got. Uh, research on factor models, consumption models, empirical methods, both are retrospective, because I've been at this even longer than Brad. <laughs> so I need to start telling you about the 90s. Gosh. <laughs> and uh, uh, a little bit of a prospective, a speculative perspective, perhaps. And then I want to relate some rules for playing the game. And then I'll finish with my top 10 reasons I am glad to be in a peer class. <laughs> so things I've learned. First, consumption models. So I have a few papers on consumption models. Uh, starting, and that dates my thesis, which was scooped by a contemporaneous paper. Uh, and they got the JPE, <coughs> and I got the JFQA. Um, so, well, the, here's what I wrote. They don't work here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but they have this great economic <laughs> intuition. So, you know, the, you, everybody knows this equation. You know, M is the stochastic discount factor of the marginal rate of substitution. I like to call it M talk. It's great. A great economic intuition. Uh, habit, Campbell and Cochran, with exogenous or external habit, won out seems over the internal, our end objects have it. Tractability, not empirical, superior performance for tractability. And Epstein and Zinn is a workhorse everywhere in terms of consumption preference models, right? Uh, anybody who works in this area nowadays, Epstein and Zinn. Uh, prospective, well, it's not over yet. Exotic preferences, behavioral, being put into these models. We're getting more structural, you know. Production, labor is going in there now. And we're getting more interaction, and I see this continuing to develop, with corporate finance and macro using these types of models. So I see this going forward for quite some time. Uh, conditional multi-factor model, cap -ems. that's uh, something I've worked on, and I've got a few papers uh, on that. And uh, what have I learned? Well, they don't work very well. <laughs> uh, but they're algebraically beautiful, you know, these beta models. And, and Jared, as a Shankin student, you saw that. You, you saw in that class that uh, his enthusiasm for the key and those linear uh, factor models. And practitioners really want them. You know, these, these uh, active portfolio managers just live and breathe these models. Uh, prospective. Well, how many of our stylized facts about these models are just data? Well, you know, that's the work that's going on. You're probably aware of some of the papers. Uh, uh, that's still a big issue. Uh, when are we going to move beyond the fun and French facts? <laughs> when are we going to do that? Uh, international conditional multi factor models. Well, all my work on this is with Cam Hardware. What have I learned? Well, they don't work very well. <laughs> okay, uh, performance evaluation and funds. So I have a few papers uh, on, this, on this stuff. And so what have I learned? Uh, conditioning seems to work. If you bring in uh, lag measures of the lagged, so publicly available information, and you really ask the question, can managers outperform? Are they smarter than what you would know if you just used this public information, interest rates, dividend yields, things that are well known? It seems to make a big difference. And portfolio managers hate that. Because, you know, the idea is you have to be smarter than what you would be if you were, say, an MBA with a spreadsheet looking at interest rates and dividend yields and the information in those in order to get credit uh, when you condition the measures and the managers hate that. So they want to get credit. Traditional alphas, you know, the linear regression alphas that we all know and use, including me, are not to be trusted. I have some papers on this. Uh, 
I spent some time surveying the literature. Uh, the simple question of if uh, if a man if a manager knows stuff, <coughs> will they generate a positive alpha? Theoretically, there's a huge literature going way way back into the '60s that struggled with this. Never could come up with a good yes. And the other simple question. If you saw one of these traditional alphas and it was positive, would it mean you'd want to buy that fund? Again, tons of papers struggle with it. Answers all over the place. Yes, no, not necessary. So the better, I've argued, is mTOR. Define the alpha as the deviation from the, uh, the mTOR equation, and that seems to work better. That's in the journal from those papers. Uh, prospective. This is a literature I think with a lot of room to run. Um, really, it was Russ Wormers, I think, who gave us access uh, to the holdings data. And now combining the holdings data with fund returns and returns on the underlying stocks, that there's so much more to do that can be done. People, I see papers all over the place where some new clever things. There's room to run. Uh, and holdings-based measures, I think, need more work. Of course, I'm working on that uh, because it needs work. Uh, empirical methods, I've got a few papers on that. What have I learned? The generalized method of loans, a workhorse, a workhorse. Everything is a special case of it. That's how I teach my, my, uh, my class. Uh, combined with MTOC, it's a match made in heaven for asset prices. It's almost like, I think Brad reminded me of this event study. Uh, and in Chicago for a while, they had these programs that would do event studies for you. Evo Wells, I've written some of these. And uh, this, you know, auto, almost automating the whole, the whole thing. And so this is, almost does this for us. The price of the continue. MTOC and GNN, you can do anything. Conditioning information is now part of the fabric of the literature. Uh, uh, okay. Sorting stocks from high to low, you know, is done it's everywhere. And it's hard to distinguish from data. It's hard to distinguish. And even a simple regression can steer it wrong. And the spectrum, particularly if it's a predictive regression, I'm actually working on that again. Prospect. Multiple comparisons is hot, and I think it's going to stay that one. Yeah, I mentioned it in the context of this, multi, you know, so many factors out there, factor models, uh, but there's so many other contexts. Brad had some good stuff to say about this, and I like his discipline, the way he's, he's thinking about checking the result to avoid the data models. You know, one of the things, so as a, as a mentor of doctoral students, you know, different, every student is different. They have different personalities, and they need different advice, right? And, but I've occasionally had these students who were so prolific running so many tests, uh, it was almost like they were thinking, I, I want to find a result that my professor's going to like, or something like that. Yeah. And so and sometimes with students like that, I, I made a rule that said, okay, every regression that you run has to be in your dissertation. Either in an appendix or in a footnote. And that's, that was another discipline. In some cases, all right, we have to really think before we regress, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to avoid these problems. Uh, optimal use of instruments and asset pricing, I've work, been working on that, and I've gone back to that, working on that again with Andy Siegel and a forward office student. Uh, panel methods and asset pricing, um, we're seeing more and more of it, I and mean, in the mutual fund, Area it goes way back. Uh, Siri and Tufano were doing panel regressions uh, long before we saw it in other areas of asset pricing, but now we're seeing it everywhere. So you, you have to know asset price, you have to know panel methods, and of course everyone, you know, I, <laughs> we have uh, you know Jerry Hoberg at USC and Gordon Phillips was there for a few years, and so and everybody wants to scrape taxes, right? and uh, and here I think. This is the next thing, uh, causal methods in asset pricing. I think I'm going to take a class in this next spring <laughs> because corporate guys are way ahead of us. They started with panel before asset pricing did. 
causal methods, they're all over it. Not so much, yes, an asset crisis, but it is coming. It is coming. And I predict if we, you know, if this session 10 years from now, in asset pricing, it'll be necessary to do causality. They'll have the causality asset pricing police. <laughs> <laughs> okay, rules for how to play the game, right? So I've been, it's, I've had a great ride, you know? It's been, a, I've been so lucky in my career, I've been in all these great places, I've visited with the V, a whole bunch of great places. And so I've learned a few things about how to play the game. And, and one of them, and, and this, this, yeah, this goes back to what, what Brad was saying. This is how I say it, is to, and I think I, it was really being in Chicago that really put this in my soul, I think. Was, there's, there's a sense of, uh, the data has some truth in them that they're trying to tell you. And your job as an empiricist is to find out what that is. Be valuable to your colleagues, right? I remember when I was at Chicago, when I first went to Chicago, assistant professor, there was this meeting uh, with the, the dean, with all the new faculty. And he said, look, the way you make your, yourself valuable here is you make yourself valuable in the research community. Any questions? So your colleagues are not just at your school. They're the community. They're the research community. Be valuable to your colleagues and you'll pay any dividends to uh, Work hard, you know, I mean, I, Rita was saying how hard it was. Okay, it's hard. I mean, you all know that. You wouldn't be here. You wouldn't have gotten to this stage if you didn't know how hard this, this work was. Uh, you got lots of balls to juggle, but you know, you got to have fun, too. And so one of the things that I often say is, you know you're going to make it in this business when you become such a nerd that you actually think you're happy. <laughs> okay, and then finally, my last thing. Is, uh, is follow the golden rule. Simple, corny, but true. You know, treat your colleagues, treat the way you want to be treated. Okay. Now, finally, there, used, there was this old guy on, on late night television who used to do, maybe you don't remember, what was, what was his name? Uh, who used to do this top 10. David Levin, that's right. And uh, so I've got my top 10. Uh, the, the, the ten, number 10 reason I'm happy to be an empirical asset pricer is all my data are machine readable. <laughs> and thanks to Ken and Gene. Number nine, it kills the conversation so I can work on the <laughs> Eight, my parents think I'm not working when I'm not teaching. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven, I meet practitioners who actually read my papers. Now that's for asset prices. In corporate finance, that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> Number six, my neighbors share their investment wisdom in parties. <laughs> Number five, my doctor students are teaching me math. <laughs> Number four, my dean wonders why I get paid so much to study models that don't work. <laughs> Number three, we make more money than public shows. <laughs> Number two, I get to use the GMM. <laughs> and number one reason I'm glad to be an empirical asset pricer is M talk is better than a secret engine. <laughs>